are some announcements that are not in your bulletin. Uh, so we'll start with the ones that are in your bulletin. Uh, first, choir practice is resuming at 7 o'clock this Wednesday. So uh, if you're an old hand at choir, you know that you meet here in the Shepherd's Room. If you're brand new to choir or if you've never sung in the choir, I am very sure Lisa Kegley would like to see your smiling face on Wednesday anyway. So you are more, of course, than well, more than welcome to uh, go to choir practice at 7 o'clock here in the Shepherd's Room. Circle, the women, anybody, Anybody, any woman in New Dublin is welcome to come to Women's Circle, uh, or not at New Dublin, is welcome to come to Women's Circle uh, on Thursday at 1.30, which also meets here in the Shepherd's Room. As a matter of polity, I need to inform you that we are having a congregational meeting on next Sunday, immediately following worship. It should be precisely as short as last Sunday's was, and it is for the purpose of electing our new class of elders. And certainly we thank the uh, nominating committee for having done their work so well and so quickly. And then note that uh, there is a concert on the 9th, that's next Sunday, at Pulaski Theater. Uh, and the information is in your bulletin. Now, the things that are not in your bulletin include that the very beautiful flowers this morning were given by Sarah and Rich Jones in memory of Rich's mother. Uh, and we thank you all for leading our worship that way. And if anybody else would like to donate flowers for any reason, uh, there, is there a sign-up sheet in the back? There is a sign-up sheet in the back that you can uh, sign up for that. And Elaine yes. has an announcement for us. Yeah, let's see if we can turn this on real quick. Uh, we really appreciate Gray Mitchell re leading Sunday school for us. Uh, I exited the study a little because I had a baby, but <laughs> we really enjoyed following that book with him. Um, so we do have, we'll be starting another little course for Sunday school. It will go back to starting at 10 a.m. Um, and the, we're going to go through a book by Craig Barnes, who's a really great Presbyterian minister. Can you guys hear the microphone? Um, and it's called Body and Soul. It basically goes through the, the catechism and tries to like apply it to our kind of modern everyday life. Um, so I put copies of the book are available in the front and in the back. And then I also photocopy just the first chapter. And I'll send that out so you don't have to have the book. You don't have to read it before you come, um, but you're welcome to do so. And we'll meet at 10 a.m. It'll be about six weeks that we'll go through this book. Sarah Jane's going to lead our first week, and we'll start next week at 10 a.m. So if anyone's interested or has any other questions, feel free to just ask me. And this is in the front and the back for everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Does anybody else have announcements? Jim. This is relating to the backpack program. Anyone who's interested in contributing to the backpack program there, and I won't use the word desperate, but they're in need of peanut butter. And the little 16 ounce jars, um, if you can buy one at a, at a, at a cut rate, <laughs> uh, they could use whatever. And if you uh, want to donate some, that's fine. Uh, let us know or let anybody know, he, Sir Jane or Richard, I think he's our representative. Um, and if you want to know, if you want to bring it to the church here, we'll collect here. If you want to take it to the uh, Methodist Church here in Dublin, call Charles uh, and Patsy Akers and they will open up the church and you can drop it off there anytime. Thank you. And we can Bye. make sure there's a box. Pardon? Oh, peanut butter. 16 ounce jars. 16, 16 ounce jars of peanut butter. <laughs> we, we can make sure there's a, a box for that in the hallway. So, Dale. Uh, the non faith committee will present a slate. Rodney's going to present a slate of offices that will be up for election next week. The reason we're bringing it up today is that there are nominations from the board Absolutely. that will be open next week, but you need to contact the person. 
where he is. <laughs> In the ancient church, they kidnapped bishops, but we don't kidnap elders, so they do have to agree. Yeah. Ronnie, would you mind coming to the to the microphone so that the online people can hear you too? <laughs> the nominating committee nominates Ann Reeves, Marie Billings, excuse me, the nominating committee consisting of Ann Reeves, <laughs> Marie Billings, <laughs> Bill Corey, and myself, uh, nominate Bethany Anderson, Peggy Fletcher, and Sarah Jones to serve for a three year term beginning in 2023 as ruling elders of the New Delhi Presbyterian Church. All right, thank you. And, and so if uh, we won't do anything with that until next week, but if next week after the session, after this worship service, we will have a congregational meeting to elect elders or to receive nominations from the board. Anything else for the good of the body? Then let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please rise as you are able and join me for the call to worship. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things that you plan for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Lord, we do desire to do your will, and we come here to worship you, determined to truly worship. But we know that we are very quickly distracted, that we very easily fall into our normal patterns of worrying about whatever's coming next in our life. And so we pray that you would help us, that you would come and take away everything that we find distracting, everything that we would be tempted to do instead of truly worshiping, so that you may be pleased with what we do here today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 487. In the blue.
They say that the only part of Christian teaching that can be proven is the doctrine of sin, because we all know it very well in our own hearts and in our own lives. We know its destructive power. But we also know that we have a savior and redeemer who is eager to forgive, more eager to forgive than we are often to confess. So in faith and in penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. We acknowledge before you, our God and creator, that we have sinned in many ways against you, not only outwardly, but much more with inward blindness, unbelief, impatience, pride, envy, hatred, malice, and in other ways, as you, our Lord and God, know well, and we cannot deeply enough deplore. But we repent of these things and are sorry for them, and earnestly ask you for mercy. For the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And be at peace. Thank you for these words, for inspiring them and for <coughs> causing them to be written and for preserving them through the danger of centuries and millennia so that you could speak them again afresh to us here and now at New Dublin. And we pray that you would give us ears and minds and hearts that are eager and receptive <coughs> to hear what you say to us today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we are reading Hebrews chapter 8. Hear the word of God. Now, the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent that the Lord and not any mortal has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in the sanctuary that is a sketch and a shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. This is the word of the Lord. When you think back, some of us don't have to think back very far. Some of us don't have to think back at all. But when you think back to school, what is your primary impression? Take a 10,000 foot view. What is your primary memory of school? We all spent a solid chunk of years in the classroom for most of our days, for most of our childhood. What do you remember? I remember my friends. I remember field trips. I remember petting a stingray. I remember, I'm not sure why this happened, but I remember sticking my hands into a cow heart. It was huge. I'm I'm sure it's not as big as I remember. Big cow heart, sticking my hands in it to learn about hearts. I remember freezing during the blazing hot South Carolina summers because our school was old and the air conditioning system was broken and the classrooms were 60 degrees. I remember how weird school lunches were that you would have pizza and corn and french fries all on the same plate. That's a balanced meal, don't you know? But above all, what I remember most of all is the stress, the anxiety. I remember being so worried in first grade that I was going to do the wrong thing that I would throw up before school like several times a week. I remember trying to figure out how to dress and act appropriately unbothered in middle school. I remember the pressure, the self-inflicted pressure, of trying to maintain perfect grades in high school so that I could go to college. I remember lying awake in college and in grad school wondering if I was really good enough to be here. It took different forms. And I'm sure what you all remember about your stress in school is different than what I remember about my stress in school. But it all boils down, doesn't it, to the anxiety of being evaluated. I don't know many people who aren't anxious about being judged and evaluated. It's a huge part of school. You've got grades and report cards, but you also have competitions. You've got sports and band and choir and auditions, and they sort you out into groups. Didn't make the cut, earned a spot in the regional choir, the regional band, or the JV. Best class, less good class, lowest class. I think some people maybe manage to not take it personally, but I think most of us do. It is kind of personal, isn't it? People looking at you and deciding how good you are at life. I think most of us have nightmares about school for years afterwards. Not because school was terrible for most of us, but because that kind of extended anxiety doesn't go away overnight. Haven't you dreamed that you're late for school? Haven't you dreamed maybe recently that there's a math class that you haven't taken all semester? Or that you've shown up without any clothes on? Being judged that way makes an impact, even if it's for the best. And school, by and large, is for the best. We learn about the world, and we become productive citizens, and we learn how to function in social context. School is good, and also, we have nightmares. We're not built for long-term judgment. And ideally, of course, the judgment of school isn't meant to be perfect. We go to school so that eventually we can live what we learn. I haven't had 
mass class in something north of a decade for which I am devoutly thankful. I got all the way through college with no math classes. But nevertheless, I add or I multiply or I work out percentages on a weekly basis at least, if not a daily basis. Nobody grades my ability to do ratios anymore. That was what my seventh grade math class was for. But the reason, right, that I was graded in seventh grade math class on my ability to work out ratios is because now I live in a world where 40% off sales are a thing. And I need to know, right? I need to know what's 40% of whatever this is. And more importantly, the math class was there to form my brain in a way that lets me conceptualize quantity and think logically and to problem solve. If you sat me down in a pre-calculus class right now, I would not like it, or you probably, very much. But having done that in the past matters. No idea what my grade was, but the grade acted as a short-term incentive to internalize skills and concepts that still matter now. The judgment, in other words, that we experience at school doesn't exist for its own sake. It's a temporary measure to shove us towards something bigger and greater and more important. Ideally, flourishing. The ability to appreciate what is true and good and beautiful. And that, says Hebrews, is kind of what the covenant has been like up till now. It's been like school, sort of. There was evaluation anyway. The Old Covenant was described like this. The covenant that the Lord made with your ancestors when the Lord took him by the hand and led them out of Egypt. But they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. The covenant that he's talking about was the one that you can read about in Exodus 24. It actually starts in 20-ish, Exodus 20-ish, but the main chunk of it happens in 24. We have heard all the Ten Commandments and a bunch of assorted other laws of God that the newly freed Israelites are supposed to follow. They hear them, and they promise something, right? Moses says, here are the laws. And the people, of Israelites, the people of Israel say, yes, we will follow these laws. And then they enact a little ceremony. There's blood involved. Um, they kill a bull. Moses throws some blood on the altar, throws some blood on the people. I think we talked about this before. Um, to signify, the blood signifies what you're calling on yourself if you break the terms of the covenant. It's like a contract law with extra teeth. And after the blood is thrown, they have this joyful moment where everybody gets to go up the mountain and they feast in the presence of God. It's great. But we all know that it doesn't last, right? Because then there's the entire rest of the Old Testament to get through. Hebrews, quoting the Old Testament, says, they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them. They break the promise. They fail out of the course. They turn away from God. And the Bible says God turns away from them. Isn't that how we experience church a lot of the time? <laughs> Don't we worry that we've messed up too many times in the same way, right? I don't know about you, but I, my, my sins are the same ones every week, pretty much. We do it over and over and over again, and at some point we think God is going to get tired of us. <laughs> Aren't we pretty sure, at least sometimes, that God doesn't want us to be his children because we're not even really seriously interested in overcoming all our sins, at least not consistently. So we think we're not going to make the team, we're going to fail out of the course. We're going to show up on the last day and find out that we're not wearing the right clothes, or maybe not wearing any clothes at all. It wouldn't have been surprising if that's the way it worked out. It would have been normal. It would have been fair, even. But it's not going to happen. 
because he says, Hebrews, because here comes this high priest that we've been talking about, the great high priest, Jesus. It says, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one, Jesus, also to have something to offer. And he did. He did. The cup of the new covenant sealed in his blood. When Moses acted as a priest to make the first covenant between God and his people, he threw the blood of a bull on the altar of God and on God's people, as we just said, to make clear what would happen if either party broke the covenant. And the covenant was broken, and the threat came true, but not in the way that anybody would have expected. God comes in the form of Jesus, the great high priest, and he fulfills the terms of that old covenant that had been broken. He was covered in blood, not this time the blood of a bull, but his own blood. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, we say, we're about to say, begotten, not made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. God became God's people. That's what that means. That's why we say it. God and God's people all at once, and pays the price of the broken covenant. And at the same time, as he fulfills the old covenant, he makes a new one. You hear it every month. You hear it from me. You heard it from Andrew. You heard it from Jean. You heard it from Ben. You heard it from Kerfoot. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. The new covenant this time is a one-sided covenant. God promises that he will be faithful to us, and he promises that he will transform us. Sometimes when we take a good hard look at ourselves and our churches, we're tempted to give up because we're pretty sure God isn't going to put up with us. But that's not the way it is. Of course, we're not perfect. And of course, it's true that we still have a lot to learn about God and God's character. If God has begun to write his law on our hearts, if he's begun to write them in our minds, if we've begun to know them, know him for ourselves, it's true that we still have a ways to go before we know him completely. But you know, school isn't the only way there is to learn. We learn at home, too. A different kind of learning, this time without grades, without that constant threat of evaluation. But we learn, don't we? We learn the character of our parents and our siblings. We learn how to live in our family. Ideally, not true for everyone, but ideally we're safe and secure when we learn these things. We're not living in fear that the love of our parents is going to run out. At home, what we learn is how to love and how to be loved. I pray that was true for you. But if it wasn't, I promise you that it's true for you now, at home with God. If you had to earn the love of your parents, you don't have to earn God's love. If you were afraid that your next mistake would get you kicked out in the streets, God is not going to kick you out. He's going to write his law on your heart. He's going to let you get to know him. You're going to live with him, and he's going to live with you. You've been adopted. You're not a student at school when you're with God. You're a child at home. He's not 
keeping track of your sins. He's not writing down everything you do that he doesn't like. He's forgotten it. And you will grow up into the kind of person who knows God, who loves God, and who has his word in your heart and your mind. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we can ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join me in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The hymn is number 513. and thanksgiving for all God has done for us. Let us return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of our life and labor.
exists in heaven and on earth is yours and it is out of your generosity that we have received what we have in thanksgiving we return these gifts to you not as if we give you something that is not yours but in gratitude that you have called us to participate in your vision for this world we pray that your spirit would go with these gifts to accomplish more than we can dream now. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all. Please be seated. As we come to a time of prayer, I have a few updates, and I hope that you all have some for us to pray for as well. Bill Kegley has returned home after a brief stint in rehab, uh, and the Kegley family is looking for um, recommendations for home health people who can stay with him during the day and help him sometimes. So if you know of recommendations there, I know that they would be glad to hear it. Um, and we also continue to pray for Bill's recovery. Jim Blakeney is still at the rehab hospital, but is coming home this week um, and is delighted for that. So please continue to pray for his recovery. Susu requests our prayers for surgery on Wednesday. This is somewhat more of a difficult surgery. They are removing a tumor that has gotten itself in her muscle. Um, so it's, it's a harder surgery, it's a harder recovery, and she requests our prayers for her as she undergoes that surgery on Wednesday. What else needs to come to our attention this morning? Jane. Family, struggling with, COVID. with COVID, absolutely. We will pray for the Ely's to recover quickly. with hospice care. We will continue to pray for Laura's grandfather, Doug, um, for a good and peaceful death for him. I have asked for prayers for my family and all the people in Fort Myers and Cape Coral, Florida. Absolutely. Seeing no others, let us go to our God in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you that you know already what we have to say, that we do not bear the burden of having to tell you in the best way possible, that we don't have to convince or manipulate you into caring about what we care about. We thank you that you are a loving father to us, and we thank you that when we do not know how to pray, your spirit prays with us and sighs too deep for words. Lord, we thank you for this congregation and for your whole church in all of the ways that it exists in the world, from the largest cathedrals to the smallest secret gatherings in houses. We thank you that no matter what the local congregation looks like, you are glorified in them. And we pray that you would continue to care for your church, that where it is persecuted, you would give courage, that you would give peace, that 
where it struggles under the temptation to complacency or indifference, that you would light it with new fire and new love. That as you have never left yourself without a witness, so in the future you never will leave yourself without a witness. We pray for the world that suffers in so many ways. We pray for places that are torn by war, for places where the violence is less organized and more random. We pray for places where the government can no longer keep peace, can no longer feed their citizens. We pray for places that are torn by natural disaster, especially this week, those that are suffering under Ian, and especially in Florida. And we pray for the United States of America, the country where you have placed us. We pray for our president. We pray for our governor and for our legislature, for all who make and judge and enforce our laws, that you would give them the wisdom to do so with equity and fairness, keeping always the good of the people in mind and avoiding any appearance of selfishness or partisan Ship. And we pray also for those who form our culture, whether formally or informally, that you would give them wisdom and the desire to honor you. We pray for those who are dearest to us, for Bill and Jen and Susu, the Elys. Doug, for family in Fort Myers. You know best what each person needs, and we pray that you would heal those who are sick, that you would comfort those who mourn or who struggle with anxiety or depression, that you would accompany those who are dying and give them the sure hope of your faithfulness. We pray that you would comfort those who grieve. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and they will come from east and west and from north and south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. Do not come to this table because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because any of us by our own merits is righteous, but because we all stand in need of the forgiving grace of God. Do not come to prove your righteousness, but to celebrate the presence of Jesus. He has made everything ready. Come and eat. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, all creation sings your praises. And we too acknowledge you to be the Lord, and that it is at all times right to honor your greatness and glory. First, because you created us in your own image and likeness, but above all, because you freed us from the enslavement of sin through your only Son, from which neither mortal nor angel had been able to make us free. Because you are rich in mercy and infinite in goodness, you gave him in love to be made man, like us in all things except sin, that by his death and resurrection, he might bring life where death had been victorious. Lord, we are not able to understand the breadth and length and height and depth of your love, which moved you to show mercy where none was deserved, and to promise and give life in a world where death had reigned, and to receive us in your grace when we could do nothing but rebel against you. True to the commandment of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we come to this table, which he has left to us to be used in remembrance of his death until he comes again. Here we declare and witness before the world that by him alone we have received liberty and life. By him alone you claim us as children and heirs. By him alone we have your favor. By him alone we are raised into your spiritual kingdom there to eat and drink with you and the Son at that most joyful table of eternal life. In the present, we on earth have communion with you in heaven. But in the time to come, we shall be raised to the endless joy prepared for us before the foundation of the world was laid. We thank you for these gifts, which you have given us through your free mercy and grace. In the name of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Moved by your Spirit, we give you all thanks and praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And having given thanks for it, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. The bread which we break. Is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Will the elders come forward?
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus also said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Let us pray together. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this number 466.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.